Yeah, that's, that's correct. I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is when we tagged these sharks in Cape Cod, no one really knew where they were going to go. And I think what we're seeing is Mary Lee lay down a track that she's been doing for years and years. It's just now for the first time ever, we have the technology and the capacity to know where she is. So I'm hoping that really, and it seems like it's true as she travels up and down the East Coast, that people are feeling more enlightened to understand where she is and get a little picture of what her life is like, rather than any sort of fear or things that used to kind of come up in the past. Yeah, what we've done is for the first time in history, we have established a proven method of capturing the ocean's giants and releasing them alive, and in between, giving the leading scientists 15 minutes of access to use all the latest technology and to do all of the research projects they've ever dreamed of. So that really happened by bringing world-class fishermen together with world-class science to kind of explode this body of knowledge forward and create this access that never occurred. And what you're seeing in the tracker and in Mary Lee's um, track and where she's going is the result of that kind of collaborative environment pushing the ball forward for the sharks in the ocean. Fact of the matter is, when we tagged her and let her go, nobody knew where she was gonna go. We don't know what is normal. We don't know what to expect. Every day, all of us are learning together, the public, the PhDs, side by side, real time. And it really is kind of historic for research, it's historic for exploration. And it's historic to bring the public so deep inside a research project and allow them to be on the leading edge of learning along with our brightest scientists in the country. It's great. Well, when we set out on this project, we wanted to try to create a brighter future for the white shark. And in order to do that, we had to have the fundamental pieces of its life. And right now, believe it or not, we don't know where they breed. We don't know where the nursery is, where they give birth. And until we have those fundamental components and understanding of its life, we don't know how to affect policy to ensure it has a robust future. And we must have a, real, a robust future for our sharks because they are the great balance keepers of the ocean. They are the lions of the ocean. And if they get removed from the system, the system will simply collapse. And so a robust if there's no robust future for sharks, there's no robust future for the ocean and in turn the planet. So that is why we must solve the puzzle of our ocean's giants, our great apex predators, understand their lives, and then leverage this groundbreaking data to ensure they have a future. Sure, you know, there's many different species of sharks and within their ecosystem, they are the top of the food chain, the apex predator, the lion of that environment. And what they do is they keep several species in check so that they don't flourish too much, which then causes a trickle down that can upset the entire ecosystem. When you look at pelagic sharks, sharks that roam the ocean, when you look at pelagic sharks, sharks that roam the open ocean, like white sharks, blue sharks, mako sharks, a lot of these sharks are under attack from the shark finning trade that's going on in Asia, which we'll talk about later. But if you remove these pelagic sharks from the environment, one of their primary roles as the great balance keeper is to keep the squid populations down. When they're gone, the squid explode like locusts and they wipe out all of the bait supply. They wipe out all the other fish and then there's nothing left. They begin to consume and cannibalize one another, and you end up with a lifeless abyss, all because we remove the sharks so they can be finned and their carcasses can be dumped overboard and the, and the ocean spirals out of control and we lose the entire future of the ocean. So that is why sharks are so important. They are the one thread in the fabric of the ocean that holds it all together and prevents it from unwinding. And right now they're being removed in an unsustainable rate. Up to 73 million sharks a year are killed for a bowl of soup in Asia. We are literally trading the future of the ocean and the planet for a bowl of soup. And that is a bad, bad trade. Well, we do see white sharks when they get into this migratory mode, traveling 80 miles or so day after day after day after day. And you can rack up some mileage when you do that. And that's what Mary Lee has done. Um, it was really interesting how she directly migrated from Cape Cod right down into the southeast, into the Jacksonville area. And then she lived down there for a couple of months, really patrolling the seashore 
what we thought was going to be her winter range between Jacksonville and Wilmington or so. And then suddenly this past week, she rounds Cape Hatteras and begins to head your way, shocking us all. I mean, we thought that she was going to be down in the southeast, taking advantage of the northern right whales giving birth and occasionally having an opportunity to feed on a calf of a whale or a birthing female. And lo and behold, she comes down there. She's extremely coastal. She's sticking her nose in and out of estuaries and river mouths all up and down the beach. And you really feel like she's just kind of patrolling back and forth. I thought she'd settled in doing that for the balance of the winter until things warmed up and she was going to head north in April or so. And it just shows you that uh, even your best guest when you've been working with these animals for some time in an environment like this where it's all so groundbreaking and brand new that nobody truly knows what's going to happen. I'm curious to see if she heads up your way. You know, she's only a day or two away from your neighborhood if she continues moving like she is now. But that would just really surprise me. But we just don't know. She could be off the coast of Virginia Beach in less than two days if she continues to travel the way she is now. She rounded Cape Hatteras yesterday. She's moved up the beach quite a bit this morning. And uh, she's well offshore, but she's northbound. Let's talk about this tracking device, how you're able to locate her. Um, uh, tell me how that works, because I, I know the, the transmitter she has sends a signal to a satellite. But you can't get a ping from that transmitter unless the dorsal fin breaks the surface, is that correct? That's correct. Mary Lee has the latest technology mounted on her dorsal fin. It's called a spot tag. So every time she comes up finning, the satellite detects that tag and begins to zero in on it. So one of the great things about Mary Lee that we don't see in other sharks is that she fins a lot and she fins for a long period of time. And that allows the satellite to initially pick up the tag. And then the longer she stays with that fin out of the water, it begins to zero in on the location and give us very, very good data on where she is. And, um, you know, in some sharks, they only come up finning once every couple months and very briefly, and we get limited data from them. But Mary Lee is truly the rock star of white sharks. She is up finning a lot every day. We're getting multiple pings. And I really think it's allowed the entire Southeast to kind of fall in love with Mary Lee and to follow her because she's giving us such regular data. And to me, that's just thrilling because I think when you think of the people of the Southeast and my biggest impression of what's going on today is they are making a huge impact on how people think about the great white shark. They are loving on Mary Lee down there. They are following her. They're engaged by her. They're wondering where she's gonna go. They're trying to solve the puzzle of her life just like the PhDs are. We've inspired the explorer and scientist and all the people down there. And I think because they have such a great relationship with the ocean in the Southeast, it's such a part of the culture and the life that I believe the people in that part of the world are helping the whole world see the white shark in a different light. And for me, that's one of the most rewarding things I've ever been a part of in all of this research. It's one thing to solve the puzzle of their life so we can affect policy to protect their future. But it's another thing to turn the corner on the perception of sharks. And that may be the most valuable thing that's occurring right now. I am surprised by this level of interest. You know, I was hoping that if we were just totally inclusive and that if we just gave everything to the, to the world and allowed the world to follow along with the scientists, that they would become engaged. And, and that's happened here in the Southeast uh, at a level in which I had hoped for, but quite frankly, I'm surprised. And I think everyone down there will be excited to know that the tracker that we're using today to track Mary Lee we're currently building a massive science, technology, engineering, and math educational curriculum about it, educational curriculum around it. And once that curriculum is done, we are going to give it to the school children of the world so they can learn about sharks, track them live. And at the same time, they're going to be learning about math and science and physics and engineering. And we'll make their learning more interesting and, and really bring all the school children of the world into this tracking and research so they understand the ocean, understand the importance of sharks, and are inspired to make sure over the course of their life that the ocean is looked after. And so when Mary Lee comes up finning, 
Even though her tag is out of the water, a satellite must be passing overhead. And that is not always the case. So there are various windows over the course of the day when the satellite is over the Southeast and the Atlantic Ocean. And fortunately, Mary Lee is pinging enough that even when the satellite is there or not there, we're getting plenty of signal. So you're right. Um, it's not as if every single time she pops up, a satellite is there waiting to grab her signal. It's a window of time as it passes overhead, then there's a dark window. And then again, the satellite comes around and opens it up. We're using what's called an Argos satellite. And um, I don't know the exact data on how long that window is, but a lot of things have to come together if you want to get a good location on Mary Lee. She has to come up finning, she has to stay up for a reasonable period of time, and then a satellite must pass overhead. When all those variables line up, we get a ping. And you can see with Mary Lee and her track, we're getting so much data that she's just finning a lot. A little bit more emotional than I normally get about when um, we're talking about this subject of, of the research we're doing. Um, we have all put our whole lives into this. The crew members, myself, every ounce of emotional energy, physical energy, treasure. Um, we've left our families for hundreds of days at a time. And to finally have that one shark like Mary Lee get tagged and show up and connect with the public to open their eyes to what's going on here and the importance of sharks in this system, the importance of sharks and understanding their lives to protect their futures has been something we never could have predicted, but something we're so, so grateful that has happened. And the fact that it's a shark that's actually named after my mother um, also just makes it more, I don't know, destiny-like. It's um, Mary Lee has truly become the most famous fish in the world for all the right reasons. And that is a great, great thing.